So today I have with me an amazing epigenetic scientist. I'm really excited. His name is Dr. Michael Skinner. Dr. Skinner has a number of patents and is the current director of the Center for Reproductive Biology at Washington State University. Dr. Skinner's epigenetic transgenerational inheritance science paper was the most cited paper around the world in reproductive science journals. The most cited research paper ever in the history of reproductive science. And he has founded companies, raises about three to 5,000 mice in his lab at any given time. And Dr. Skinner is especially famous for his groundbreaking work with epigenetics. Uh, which we're going to talk about in inheriting disease susceptibility through epigenetics. He's given a TED talk on this topic called Ancestral Ghosts in Your Genome. And his scientific motto is, if you are not doing something controversial, you are not doing something important. So welcome, welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, so when we ate lunch a few weeks ago at, at, here in Minnesota, uh, you told a story about your scientific journey and especially the importance of serendipity in science. So can you explain what serendipity is and how serendipity played a role initiating your career? Um, in, in science, we work very hard to do experiments and come up with theories and sort of advance the science forward. That's sort of what we do. Um, but the concept of major observations where it's a groundbreaking something completely unexpected for the most part historically most major scientists have said that the key observation was very serendipitous in other words it wasn't something that they necessarily expected and it takes some serendipitous observation in the lab to suggest something might unique might be going on and then you sort of get into that. So for ours, we were studying the toxicology of a specific uh, compound on effects on sex determination in the early developing embryo, whether you turn into a male or female. And so we did a series of experiments, um, did the exposures, got the offspring, and essentially found that there was no effects on sex termination, very little effects of the compound at all, and so essentially it was a failed experiment. When those animals grew up to become adults, they did get some disease, the males developed some infertility problems. So we published a paper on that. Then uh, a few months later, a postdoc came into the lab, or came into my office, and she simply said that she was very upset and said she made a mistake and bred that first generation animal to the next generation. We didn't plan that experiment. And so uh, when we got, when we, I, I just said, don't worry about it, go and look at the characteristics of that uh, second generation. A few months later, she came back and says, it's exactly like the first generation, we had this male infertility phenotype. Of course, I didn't believe her and had to go back and repeat, repeat it 15 times and basically so that it took it out four generations. And so that's when we sort of serendipitously found this transgenerational phenomena and uh, have followed up since in the area of epigenetics. And so the major observation or, that got us down this line of investigation was a very serendipitous thing. And I think in science, that's probably more the case. Although we think that we're really smart and can figure all these things out, uh, when think something's really out of the realm that you're thinking about, it's hard to think about these uh, observations up front. So it's much more serendipitous observations. So yes. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. It's an amazing story. <laughs> um, for non-science listeners, can you actually explain epigenetics in simple terms, and maybe even throw in there, you know, F zero, F one, F two, and F three generations? Because we'll probably discuss some of that soon. Sure. So epigenetics uh, is described as sort of molecular factors and processes that are around the DNA that sort of alter what genes are on and off. Okay, so they alter your what's called expression, but basically what genes are on and off in, in, in the DNA. And this has to be completely independent of what we think about in terms of genetics, which is the DNA sequence. So epigenetics doesn't care what the sequence is. It basically functions on the DNA separate from that sequence. Okay. 
so essentially, it's the things around the DNA that can regulate what genes are on and off, but it's completely independent of genetics. And so that's, it's called epigenetics. And there's a number of different types. For example, methylation of DNA, small chemical groups that get attached to the DNA, we know that those methyl groups on the DNA can actually turn genes on and off. Uh, there's proteins that the DNA is wrapped around called histones, and chemical modifications of those proteins, again, can turn genes on and off independent of DNA sequence. Uh, the structure, whether there's coils and loops, that can also regulate gene, uh, what genes are on and off as well. And then there's small RNA molecules that don't express proteins, but basically small RNA molecules that can do the same thing. So there's a number of epigenetic processes, and they're all geared towards regulating what genes are on and off, and everything's independent of DNA sequence. And so it's somewhat distinct from the classic genetic concept. Yeah, and... Uh... Well, bring, I'll come back to the RNA, especially because what you said in your talk uh, was really interesting. And I want to go back to that. But first, um, I think, well, maybe it was epigenetics essentially in the beginning just marks on top of DNA. I mean, that was how, the, how it originated with maybe methylations. And then it became more recognized that there's all these additional things you're talking about. Right. So um, the concept of epigenetics and the term epigenetics was coined in the 40s and 50s by a fellow named Conrad Waddington. And he was a professor at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And at that time, he was the chairman of the largest genetics department in the world, which there weren't that many genetics departments at that time. And so, and he was, he basically studied interesting things that were not, they would, observations that didn't follow normal genetic rules. And so he was sort of studying these things that were unique. And what he came across is this concept that there is this other area, and he called it epigenetics. And epi means above or outside. And so essentially, it, the epigenetic sort of things were above the DNA sequence. Now, at that time, very, very little molecular information was available. They didn't know how this worked. And his research wasn't really recognized at the time very well. And it was also at the same time the DNA structure by Watson and Crick had been identified. So that sort of took center stage in genetics really took off. So it was almost 30 years later in the 70s when DNA methylation, the small methyl groups that get stuck were identified. Nobody really paid attention to them until sort of the 90s. And in the 90s is, is when most of the epigenetic, in the 90s and the 2000s, 10, 15 years ago, is when most of the epigenetic marks have been thoroughly characterized. Interesting, yeah. And, and most of your experiments illustrate what happens to offspring in the womb during chemical exposures, and, and especially what happens to the F3 generation, because that couldn't possibly have been, that generation couldn't possibly have been exposed to those original chemicals, correct? Correct. So the concept is this. Uh, if you expose a gestating female, a pregnant female, the female, which is the individual exposed, is called the F0 generation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then in a pregnant female, of course, the fetus is there that's going to be the offspring. So that's called the F1 generation, and that's basically the offspring. And they're directly exposed to, and then it's kind of complicated, but inside that fetus mm -hmm. is the sperm or the egg that eventually will develop in that fetus to make the grand offspring. And so essentially, if you expose a gestating female, the F0 generation is exposed, the F1 generation offspring is exposed, and the grandchildren's germline is all that's going to generate the grandchildren is also exposed. So what we do is we take it out th three or four generations, and at the third generation, at the great-great-grand offspring, there's essentially no chance of any d exposure like it was obtained in, by the gestating female or the fourth generation or beyond. And so that's where we realized that this was transgenerational, not involving any direct exposure, whereas in the earlier generations is direct exposure. So that's how you think about the F1, 2, 3, and the transgenerational part. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, I tell people about epigenetics sometimes, and and they say, yeah, in two or three generations, you know, that's that's how far it goes. But they don't realize 
your research, I mean, it shows it goes beyond that. And that's, that's something people really need to recognize. I mean, it really, that that's a powerful, you know, result and finding. So, and also based on your talk at the Mayo Clinic, you've tested at least 10 different chemicals. Um, and they include, just so people know, the fungicide chemical, number one, called vinclozolin. Uh, number two, flutamide, which is an anti-androgenic androgenic drug. Um, number three, dioxin. Number four, various plastic chemicals like BPA and phthalates. Um, number five, jet fuel, which is basically kerosene. Number six, DEET, bug spray ingredient. Uh, and permethrin, presumably from the chrysanthemum plant. Is that right? Yeah, and it's a it's a insect it's a per pesticide basically. Yep, yep. And then number seven, uh, DDT, mosquito malaria prevention chemical. Um, number eight, methoxychlor, another insecticide. Number nine, mercury, um, as in the heavy metal mercury. And then finally, number ten, atrazine, the estrogenic herbicide. So why did you choose these chemicals originally? Is it because they're environmental contaminants or? Was there any other? I mean, there's a lot of different options that you could have chosen. Why did you pick these ten? <laughs> so, um, vinclozolin was the first one we tried, and, and first of all, I'm not a classic toxicologist, and so we're we're not really in the business of testing chemicals for risk assessment, toxicology type stuff. Mm -hmm. We are strictly looking at this epigenetic transgenerational inheritance phenomenon, and so we need. A variety of different things to study to be able to get at that. So the reason that different compounds were were chosen was most of those have very different signaling systems in the cell in terms of the way they act on the cell is very different. So, for example, uh, dioxin uh, it has it it's not ster steroidogenic. It doesn't influence any steroid sort of interactions. Whereas DDT or, or bisphenol A, those actually act on steroid receptor type systems, so those are more endocrine sort of things. Hydrocarbon mixtures like jet fuel, it's a hydrocarbon. We don't even really know how, how they can act on the cell. It's a very different signal. And so we sort of chose the different compounds to have different signaling systems. At first, we thought that might be a factor. But it turns out all of them do it, so that means multiple sort of signaling systems that can be involved or interfered with to promote these epigenetic changes. And, and what, time of, uh, what types of health impacts do you generally see from you know, these various chemicals? Okay, so transgenerationally what we see is a whole variety of things. We study outbred rats because it's more of a normal species rather than being an inbred experimental model. And a number of people use those in inbred models and that's fine, but their phenotypes are very isolated to one or two phenotypes, whereas the outbred rats give us a whole variety. And so what we see is uh, some cancers, the prior principal one being breast cancer, both in males and females. Uh, the reproductive systems of both the male and the female are influenced. The testis is affected in the, in the male. The prostate is affected um, in the female. It's the ovary that's affected, and there actually are some uterine alterations. And so essentially and it can cause infertility or a number of diseases. So, for example, in the testis, we see testis disease and male infertility. We see prostate disease and hyperplasia. In the female, we'll see ovarian abnormalities like polycystic ovarian disease, which is the most common female reproductive disease today. And then we'll also see some infertility things. We also see kidney disease in the males and females. We see behavioral effects in terms of the brain, uh, mostly anxiety le levels going up in the females and down in the males. And so we see a whole variety of this. About 90% of the animals uh, by the third generation have at least one or more diseases and so it's a wow. very high frequency induction and uh this might be a huge can of worms that you don't want to open but have you tested any chemotherapy drugs so i did, do have a collaborator at the seattle children's hospital and she studies she's a ne uh, uh, on, ne uh, a pediatric pediatric oncologist mm -hmm. So she treats boys in their teenage years when they develop bone cancers, primarily. And so she gave them chemo, and basically what we found then 
when we, as they became adults, when they were around 30 years of age, we actually looked at, uh, at their sperm, and their sperm actually had a, a very reproducible mark amongst all the patients tested of epigenetic changes. And so now we think that the chemo has the capacity to send something to the next generation, but the direct studies in the animal model have not been done. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we're trying to get grants on that now. And because that will be an important thing. In other words, if we, right. if someone gets chemo, chemo early in life and then tries to have children later in life, they need to know whether something gets packed. We did, we haven't done those studies. Yet. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And obviously, I I see a common pattern in a lot of your chemicals, like you talked about the BPAs, the phthalates that are estrogenic, and it's amazing that you're finding these other chemicals that aren't, you know, artificial estrogens that cause these disease susceptibility changes. It's amazing to me. Um, but one thing I remember that stuck out at, uh, stuck out to me in your research was that, you know, atrazine especially, I remember this with, was that lower doses seem to have bigger effects in many cases. Am I remembering that correctly? And what's going on if I am? <laughs> no, that's correct. Uh, both with the bisphenol A, we ran dose and found that the lowest doses had a bigger effect for the uh, DDT. It was the same thing. So we've tested on a number of the environmental chemicals, uh, a lower and a higher dose, and oftentimes it's the lower doses have effect. So in, in toxicology, the field or endocrinology today, we actually know that many, many uh, compounds, we're used to actually running these dose curves where they go to high levels, and it used to be in toxicology, the concept was the dose was the poison. In fact, mm -hmm. that, that, that term was actually po proposed back in the mid 1800s hmm. by Claude Bernard type situation or in some of his colleagues so anyway so so essentially the whole field's gone towards only thinking about high doses being harmful but if you actually go from a high dose to a low lower dose it'll drop down and then if you go, go to a real low dose sometimes it comes back up mm -hmm. and there's a there's a mechanism in, in pharmacology that would explain that is Normally, with any receptor system or signaling system, if there's a you know, compound like an estrogenic substance and acts on a receptor, it, it will cause the signaling for a little bit, and then if there's a high enough amount, it will down-regulate. Basically, the receptor system down-regulates, so then you lose the signal. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it turns out if you give high doses, things shut off really well, and so if you go down from that, then it basically gets to this negative inhibition. Now, if you go to a really low dose, it's it's low enough that it binds the receptor, but there's not a high enough dose to shut it off. And so the yep. signaling system keeps happening. And so there, it's thought that this biphasic dose, that that's part of it. You don't have the negative feedback, and that allows a low dose to actually cause an effect. It's a great, great explanation. And you think that's specific to hormones or that extends beyond the, the sex hormones? I think basically we initially identified it in the endocrine field with hormonal steroid hormones, but now we realize that it's probably across the field for everything, peptide, hormone, everything. So yeah. I don't think it's going to be a unique to the steroids. It'll be a common down regulation of things is a common bio biochemical procedure in pharmacology that's well known. Well, the other one that was interesting too was that, that, that research you did on atrazine where you didn't see a first generational effect at all um, and then you started to see that later. Can you explain that? Yeah, so in the atrazine study, which we just published a month ago, uh, and essentially what we found was the first generation uh, the, the exposure of the gestating female had no effect on the F1 generation, and actually not a whole lot of effect on the F2, some, but not as much. But the F1 had no effect. But by the F3, like I said, 90% of the animals had sort of major diseases. And we saw a number of sort of major testis disease, which is a major disease in the males. And then there was this <coughs> metabolic disease that we saw as well. So essentially, uh, there was no effects. We've actually seen that phenomena to a degree with other things as well. The deep permethrin uh, mixture that we use in humans for insects, or I'm sure most people have used it for mosquitoes sort of repellent, mm -hmm. uh, it has no effect in the F1 generation, but significant effect in the F3 generation. Hmm. So what this is suggesting, and we're starting to see that more, 
is these compounds in the current setting of toxicology, when you primarily look at direct exposure, that there is no risk. risk. They're very safe, there's no issues, there's no long-term effects. These are very safe compounds if you only use the direct exposure toxicology approach. We, we thought about the fact that if this affects the germ or the sperm or the egg, and it changes their epigenetics, that essentially that'll go to the next generation and the next generation and so forth. So what we see is that we now need to start thinking about generational toxicology. In other words, yeah. to put these multi-generational studies within the field of toxicology. And the most that are done now is maybe one, maybe two generations, but if they don't go to those F3 generations, we just don't see the transgeneration. So this is, this is sort of going to be a very difficult thing to get uh, changed in the toxicology field. Mm -hmm. It means a much more complicated approach than they currently take. Yeah. I suspect a lot of the compounds that we actually know, which just like atrazine, that looks very safe, but uh, actually we actually see it affecting my great granddaughter. Well, that's a big effect. It doesn't hurt us. Mm -hmm necessarily they want to affect our great grand offspring. So that's what we're sort of starting to see. And yeah. that's an area of toxicology that's not been seriously considered. That's amazing, I think. And and I mean that combined with what you just said about the dose making the poison, because that's almost a dogma. I mean you hear that with PhD scientists all the time. I still hear that, you know, yep. frequently. And I think it's silly. <laughs> That we're not thinking about these biphasic interactions, especially with hormones. And I must say, the investigator, <clears throat> there's a couple of investigators that sort of come across this a number of years ago, and and they have had a very difficult time mm -hmm. dealing with industry and government in terms of uh, maintaining their funding, having you know threats oh. and all sorts of stuff dealing with it, because this definitely challenges, just like we our studies do as well challenge yeah. their current thinking about toxicology yeah and in fact it's good timing actually i was going to ask you uh you know you gave a talk in europe regarding vin clausalin and you talked about it at lunchtime uh and i went back to the lab actually and i was talking to another scientist there he's from i don't know germany or something and he said he was actually at that talk that you gave over there so i was going to see if you could tell that story for us uh because it kind of it kind of illustrates kind of the extremes on both sides maybe the extremes in europe um with regulatory hair trigger regulatory thinking and then the extreme in america where we oftentimes you know have this corporate influence or whatever and we just don't outlaw these chemicals so could you tell that story so yeah in in the united states we have a system in place that has a significant amount of industrial influence on congress and the epa and so forth <clears throat> so it's, we haven't seen really any banned drugs in, in I think, 20, 25 years. Um, uh, there are lots of drugs that reach a level of concern and so forth in the EPA that people are informed about. They try to pr reduce their, their uh, use and so forth, but banning the drugs or stopping their marketing is not something we see very much of in the United States. And that's, and, and that's because of the, through the EPA, you said? Yeah, the EPA is in charge of that, and one of the issues is Congress has a direct sort of impact year annually on the EPA's budget, and mm -hmm. then, of course, industry is lobbying Congress pretty heavily, and so the EPA and the FDA are two agencies that aren't separated from that congressional pressure, and so mm -hmm. places like the NIH and NSF and those types of agencies, they they were congressionally set up so they would be distinct, and they can't. So there's that not that direct interaction. So it removes the politics from what we do, basically. So PA and the FDA, those are very linked. And so that's part of the problem, is there's lots of politics, industry, industrial pressure, and muscle force. And so we don't see the changes very quickly in the U.S. compared to Europe. In Europe, what we see is more of a preventative sort of approach where essentially if there's research that shows potentially that this compound is potentially hazardous or at least to consider for risk, 
that essentially, if there's enough reports like that, then very quickly they will put back to industry and they need to do the experiments to show that they're not a risk. Right. And so and they will either suspend or ban the drug in the company. In the country. And so essentially, it's a very proactive approach, and therefore, now, however, they, some of them are very, very active. So if there's one or two studies, they will actually ban a compound from the quick. And it's, it's important to remember that you're, you're working in a society that has a large amount of agriculture and so forth to produce food and everything else, and all these compounds that they're trying to use to actually help them get more food. And so it's, we, we demand that as the public, and then there's the, so, it's, so we have to balance this situation. So essentially, yes, what I was, I gave a talk on the reclosal and transgenerational work. There's some other studies that have already started to suggest that direct toxicology may be somewhat an issue. But within a few weeks, this Switzerland sort of actually stuck that ban this use of reclosal. Um, however, uh, you know, at this point, what I will say is, Vinclozolin has a very short half life in water. It actually breaks down very quickly. It, yeah. it doesn't really stick around, so it's not one of these. It's not something like DDT, like atrazine. Yeah, They're, it's not going to be around for a long period of time. So it's very quick. Mm -hmm. The body system actually also breaks it down fairly quickly as well. But when it gets into your system, it's actually neutralized fairly well. And the, and, the, and the information on, on Vinclozolin in terms of toxicology shows that it's a problem. And I, I agree, it's a very safe compound and so forth. So in terms of the real exposure, it's probably the person that actually is spraying on the, on the grapes or the vegetables that's going to be exposed. It's not the general public. So there, it is a relatively you know, safe compound. Um, so in, a, in essence, I think that you know banning the compound really quickly was probably not the best strategy. We need to sit back and sort of balance this. And so it's a it's a it's a comp doing toxicology and risk assessment and societal sort of needs. It's not a simple sort of thing. It's something we have to you know balance. What I do as a scientist, I think it's important that we show if there is an effect at this level of dose and so forth, or here's your generational effect, we need to be aware of that. And then there's other people that are really trained in this field to actually try to work through the risk assessment. So yeah. in other words, Europe responds very quickly and the U.S. very slowly. So it's sort of at both ends of the field and probably what we initially need is something in the middle. Yeah, and what about timing with these exposures? You know, for example, you know, maybe I'm being exposed right now to vinclozolin, but, you know, during actual reproduction or maybe in, in the mouse model, you know, like you can have these exposures, but if they're not during the actual uh, reproductive years or during a certain time point during pregnancy, I mean, are there variations there? So, uh, yes, we tend the scientific field actually sometimes forgets too that probably the most important to start thing to start thinking about in the field of toxicology and everything else, for especially on exposures, it, it really is more of a developmental biology issue. Mm -hmm. So if if you consider that, when you're a fetus is the most sensitive time for any damage and risk for an environmental exposure. Okay? Because all of your organ systems are developing, and the e the quickest way to actually cause an abnormality is to hit it really early in development when the stem cells are just mm -hmm. developing in and, and everything started developing. So in these early embryonic periods where most of the organ systems are developed, there's the most sensitive time. Then postnatally, right after birth for a few, several years, up to five, there's a lot of other organ systems that are actually developing as well, particularly the brain is developing as well. And then basically, even during the pubertal period, when your mammary gland and the, and the female or prostate and the male, there's other organ systems developing during puberty. So those, yeah. that's also a sensitive time. Now, as an adult, most of the, all the organ systems are then established. Everything's sort of developed. And then once it's developed, it's hard to actually get it to change. And so, therefore, adults are relatively resistant to environmental sort of exposures. So it's those earlier times. And now we know that actually much of the disease we see later in life when you're in your 50s, 60s, and 70s, 
isn't necessarily anything going on when you're 50, 60, or 70. It what happened in those earlier times, either a fetus, postnatally, or puberty. In other words, an exposure of your mammary gland during early pubertal period will have mm-hmm. ability to change the cells, so all the cells in the mammary gland now are shifted you know, in terms mm-hmm. of their epigenetics and can change the bio- or bi- physiology of tissue, such that later in life you now have an increased susceptibility to get breast cancer. It's well, what's mm-hmm. going on in puberty, which is mm-hmm. what's causing this. Okay? And so essentially that's called the developmental origins of health and disease later in life. It's the zohab, basically. So these early life exposures are really more important. And it's the same exact thing for toxicology. If we need to think about toxicology, the areas we need to be more cautious about is gestating females, early postnatal and pubertal periods, not so much as old adults. However, we now know that adults exposed to a series of things can pass forward transgenerational effects, even without a fetus being there. And there's a half dozen labs now that we haven't, but half a dozen labs of other labs have shown this sort of thing can go forward. So and that's because the male in particular has a, a constant turnover of the sperm production in the testis, okay? And so because of that stem cell in there and there's this constant turnover, it's sensitive to actually go forward. So it doesn't, the exposures are not gonna affect us, but what we're going to do is pass them to, to our children and grandchildren and so forth if that gets changed. So, so it's not that we're not immune to it, but we're less, we're less sensitive. And so do these epigenetic changes, uh, do they mostly happen or, or always happen during the methylation erasing stages? Um, so when we expose ours during fetal development, uh, mm-hmm. we expose during what's called the gonadal sex determination, when it's when your gonads turning into a testis or an ovary. <clears throat> During that time, or right before it as well, there's the stem cell that's going to turn into the sperm or the egg, and it's called the primordial germ cell. Okay, So it's the stem cell for the sperm or the egg. So it goes through this DNA methylation erasure right before sex determination to get you in this stem cell state. And then at sex determination, then it goes in a male or female specific manner, it gets methylated in this male or female specific manner to give you your adult stem cells, adult sperm or egg. Okay? Mm-hmm. So that's, yes, there's this change. Now, the other time this is happening is right at fertilization when the egg and the sperm come together at fertilization, and you have the early embryo developing. Mm-hmm. Norm- normally, the reason there's a DNA methylation erasure which creates the embryonic stem cell which then turns into all the cell types that are going to turn into the rest of the body. Okay? So that's another time that's fairly sensitive as well. And then every time you have a stem cell that's going into an adult cell, for all those different organ systems, is this time it's sensitive. Yep, yep. For the adult testis, we have a stem cell in our adult testis called a somatogonia, which basically then generates mature sperm all the time, constantly. Mm-hmm. If you would change that stem cell, then essentially all the sperm you're producing are now going to have an abnormal epigenetics. And so the way to think about it is, yes, it's early life, but some tissues have, like the immune system, gastrointestinal tract, you know, mm-hmm. germ cell stuff, those have adult stem cells that are sensitive to those. That's a good point. Because where I was kind of going with that question in my mind was kind of, which times in your life should be you should you be especially careful not to expose yourself from the, to these chemicals because there are you know you can eat whole foods organic foods locally grown whatever and and you can do pretty good but it's expensive it's hard to sustain that so you know i mean it sounds like it's it that's not the optimal strategy but during reproduction would be the you know at least the most important or the priority well, I get this thinking question about a lot. Um, <clears throat> give talks, particularly to the public. They say, "What can we do?" Yeah, yeah. So I always give them the story. Is a few years ago now, um, my daughter was living in Indianapolis at the time, and she said, told me that she wanted to have a baby, and I says, "Great." And so what I did is I actually put an inline water filter in the house, and so essentially <laughs> all the water going in was purified. And essentially, with these really large charcoal filters and so forth. 
So yep. everything they were bathed in, cooked in, drank, and everything else. Wow. During mm -hmm. the gestation is when my granddaughter's fetus was going to be exposed. Mm -hmm. And so essentially that's what I really wanted to avoid, plus early postnatal as well. And so you can take actions which aren't necessarily inexpensive to actually put in place, and really pregnancy and gestation is really the most critical time. But also yeah. early postnatal children, you know, you have to be very careful with them as well. It's harder to actually work with your teenagers because they're exposed to lots of stuff. But essentially, the teenage girls, especially early period, uh, is also another period. So those are the those are the populations you really need to pay attention to in terms of you know contaminated water or, or what they're eating and so forth. That's just those are what I would you know, suggest. And so you can take measures from now as an adult. Yes, the better lifestyle, or, you know, the better food you eat, that's definitely going to help your health later in life. Mm -hmm. it's not a bad thing. Uh, but well, we, yeah. our focus should be on these younger generations. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of people are going to perk up just when you mentioned gastrointestinal, like your, uh, your intestinal stem cells being changed, because a lot of people now are struggling with, you know, impermeability and essentially leaky gut. So that's, that's an interesting thing. I, didn't, I hadn't even thought of that. And I think about this a lot, so um, I'm glad you mentioned that. And 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 what you know? Can you explain maybe what happened to Dolly the sheep? Speaking of stem cells, and uh, you know, because I think there's a lot of epigenetic factors involved, and a lot of people don't know that story. So, um, so Dolly was the first clone sort of mammalian model, and so essentially, or animal. So essentially. Um, when you clone, what happens is you take, let's say, a skin cell, which is a normal adult cell, and you take that cell, and you basically, you pull that cell out, you pull the nucleus of that cell out, and, you, and, 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 and basically what, you, what you're gonna do is take that DNA, and then you can actually put it inside an egg it normally has a nucleus in it, but you've removed it, so then you put this new nucleus in that egg, okay? Now you have a new egg. So then, basically, you can then clone that in, that in original individual based on that, and you basically get an offspring and so forth. Now, it's a very complicated technical sort of thing, but that's cloning, reproductive cloning. So what we have found with reproductive cloning now with at half a dozen, if not a dozen, different animal model systems is the initial clone generation, so the offspring from the clone, is a clone. But they also have a very high degree of disease. And so most of the animals, including Dolly, actually die prematurely of a variety of different sort of diseases, and, and Dolly clearly did. Now, if Dolly or any other animal then breathes to the next generation, the next generation is very healthy and everything's normal and they're actually a fairly close, you know, in, in terms of the original. But the actual clone has abnormalities and the primarily abnormalities come from abnormal epigenetics. Mm -hmm. The epigenetics in the clone wasn't programmed normally. And so, therefore, yeah, yeah. everything was different. Instead of having a normal stem cell driving everything, you have this artificial cell that has a bunch of epigenetics that shouldn't be there. And so then all the cells that were generated from it have the same thing. So everything's epigenetically shifted. And so it's thought to a large degree the clones are abnormal because of that. And if you breed those clones and go out, then things are normal. But the original clone is not. And so, yes, okay. clone, cloning is a great example of how if you alter the epigenetics, you have large amounts of disease later in life. And when you're sequencing these epigenetics, I mean, what's the process, maybe, if you can explain? So, I mean, like what specific techniques are you running? So, um, normally what we do today, first of all, the area of epigenetics was somewhat impeded in the 70s and 80s because the technology just wasn't there. It wasn't until the 90s we started started to have it come up and it really kind of really developed rapidly after the you know, 2000 sort of period in that, or first 10 years. Mm -hmm. So the primary uh, procedure we use today is, is called next generation sequencing. Mm -hmm. So here we take DNA, you fragment it down into small pieces and you, and you take the entire thing 
and you actually sequence everything that's in it. You sequence all that DNA. So what we do is we actually take an antibody that sees that methyl group on the DNA and actually separate out the methylated DNA from everything else. And then we sequence that and actually get what's methylated. And then we do, let's, in this case, we do a control versus an exposure, and then we compare the cells, and then basically you can get you can figure out where there's these epigenetic changes. There's also a chemical modification of the DNA you can do to convert. If there's a methyl group there, it'll convert the ones that aren't methylated, but not the ones that are methylated. And so you can, there's other procedures as well. Uh, for other things, we do what's called a chip seek. And so you basically take an antibody like the, to, the, to the methyl group, pull all the thing down, and then you do a seek. So the procedure now is called chip seek, and it basically relies on this next generation sequencing technology, which is rapidly developing in current science. Yep, and the methylation one, you do bisulfite sequencing also? Yeah, so that's where the chemical model, the bisulfite, come in. Yep. And basically, yep. it'll convert that DNA, the, the Cs get converted to Ts with the bisulfite, mm -hmm. but if it's methylated, it won't convert it. So you can actually map which ones are methylated and which ones are not. Okay, That's a different yep. Yeah, and, and, you know, I mean, I know this is a little bit different, but it's related. Um, can you actually speak to the C to T DNA base, care, base pair conversion uh, you observe in nature? Um, and and for, most pe for people that don't know, of course, DNA code is made of A's, T's, G's, and C, A, T, G, C base pairs. Right. And, I, and if I remember, um, the, the, the most common mutation is the C to T mutation. All right, the most so, common point mutation. Yeah. Uh, thing called a single nucleotide polymorphism, a SNP. Mm -hmm. It's really called a point mutation. 90% of all of the point mutations we observe is a C to T conversion. Okay? Mm -hmm. And in natural sort of setting, evolutionarily and so forth, if the, met if the C is methylated, it has the susceptibility to actually get converted to a T versus just a normal C that's not methylated being converted. Okay, so if there's methylation, you have this ability to convert to a T over long, generationally over, over some length of time. And so therefore, 90% of all of our point mutations are, SNP, are C to T conversions, which that tells you that the epigenetics is actually playing a significant role. DNA methylation is playing a significant role in your genetic mutation. Yeah, which is an added layer. Right. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> Environmental epigenetics can actually influence your mutation susceptibility. And so your genetic variation, your mutations that you may have, was to a large degree with most genetic mutations known, it's, it can be influenced by the epigenetic state, which that means the environmental epigenetics can actually create or alter your genetic variation. That's, that's incredible, fascinating, yeah. What about mitochondrial genes? I know I asked you this after your talk, um, but do you know if, I mean, obviously mitochondrial have their own unique DNA, so they must have some epigenetic imprinting, yes? Yes, there's, all, there's DNA methylation there, there's histones there, there's modifications. Many of the differential methylation uh, de regions, the DMR, differential methylation regions that we see, we also see in mitochondrial, so we actually have specific sites to get altered in the mitochondrial DNA, as well as what's called the autosomes, all the normal nuclear DNA. Uh -huh. uh, so essentially, yes, mitochondrial DNA is equally under epigenetic control as the normal sort of. And, and you said mitochondrial, so mitochondrial DNA is circular, um, and you said it has histones? I didn't actually know that. So mitochondria wrap around histones even though the DNA is circular? It just has a different secondary structure. Sure. Interesting. So in other words, all of the, you know, the histone epigenetic changes are in play there too. So, so then going back to the non-mitochondrial DNA genome, and I just have a few more questions. Um, but, you know, where are you seeing these epigenetic changes after exposing uh, animals to these chemicals? In other words, are these changes on the genes or promoter sequences of the DNA? You know, like where specifically, if, uh, if you can explain that simply. <laughs> it's kind of a technical question, right. but I'm curious. So, uh, so you have this, 
most if you actually took all of the genes and promoters known for the 30,000 genes that we have in our genome, and you actually then compared that to the total DNA that we have, the amount that's associated with genes and promoters is approximately 15% of the genome. So it's basically less than 20%. Mm -hmm. So essentially, the vast majority of the genome has nothing to do necessarily with the location of the genes, per se, okay? So when we do an epigenetic analysis, and we do everything genome-wide, so we look at everything, we do find some epigenetic changes to differential methylation re regions and so forth in promoters and sometimes the bodies of genes, okay? But probably close to 70 or 80 percent of what we see is what's called intergenic. It's not even close to a gene, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so essentially, these changes there, for a long time, we didn't know exactly what they did. However, there is this new concept that there's this whole series of, not, of things called non-coding RNAs mm -hmm. that are in throughout the genome. Just to give you an idea, we have 30,000 genes, but we have over 250,000 non-coding RNAs, different non-coding RNAs almost tenfold more than how many genes you have. Well, it turns out, if you look at the genome, these guys are, every, you know, lots of places we never even thought, not even close to genes, okay? Mm -hmm. So it turns out that a lot of the epigenetic sites we see for, like, di differential methylation are near non-coding RNA sites, which get expression of these small non-coding RNAs that can act at a distance. So we... we a few years ago proposed this thing called an epigenetic control region, which means that there's this DNA methylation group of, of sites there, and near it are these non-coding RNA sites, these small RNAs or long RNAs that get expressed, and they can act at, at a distance. The, the number is like a megabase, a million bases away, it can actually influence a gene expression. Okay? So this is this then covers a big chunk of the genome, and, and so epigenetics will doesn't necessarily have the same mechanism to control uh, gene expression that classic genetics does, where you have this promoter next to a gene and transcription factors and all that sort of stuff. So it's, it gives us a whole new realm of how the genome is, is regulated in terms of gene expression, what genes are on and off. And are we are we readily uh, able to investigate these two hundred fifty thousand non coding RNAs at this point, or is it just just still such a young field? It is a relatively young field, but we have met much more genome resources available to us. Um, we may not catch them all, but we actually can catch a large piece and a piece of it. So we're doing the collaborators and so forth. We're doing a lot of the non coding RNA stuff. And there's a better annotations all the time, and uh, actually better information on functions of the non coding RNAs as well. And so I think it's probably going to be in the next 10 years or so, we will have a really much better grasp of this other part. And it does interplay with the genetics. In other words, these promoters and genes are absolutely essential. It's just that the regulation is much more complicated than what we originally thought. And this epigenetics may be equally important as genetic factors in the regulation of gene expression. Yeah, that's that's incredible. I mean, I I already I use Excel when I uh, you know analyze RNA seq data with the thirty thousand genes, and I already crash Excel. I can't even imagine <laughs> running two hundred fifty thousand genes and trying to analyze that. Obviously, I would have to kick it up a notch with my software, right. but. Uh, Maybe the final question. I know this is hard, uh, tough question, but I'm I'm personally curious about this, um, and and that's speaking to the male and female differences. And so, I'm assuming that if males are exposed to certain chemicals, that they pass these phenotypes to offsprings, and if females are exposed, they also you know increase de disease susceptibility in offsprings. Um, and so, what's you know like say if a male is exposed, what type of you know, phenotype health impacts does that have on the the future boys and girls, and, or and vice versa? With if, if just a female is exposed in a relationship, and this could be an animal relationship or human, but if just a female is exposed, what type of uh, health impact does that have on the boys and girls in the future, right. if if any? 
specific impact? So I'm, I'm going to give you an answer that's – I'm going to have to explain a couple of things first before I get directly to it. Mm-hmm. So in contrast to genetics, um, when the, the male – the sperm and the egg come together, the male is carrying the paternal allele. And so half the DNA is in the male, and it's called mm-hmm. the paternal father's DNA. And then the female is carrying the maternal DNA half of it basically these come together and form your DNA to give you a diploid cell in the early embryo and then all the other cells to come from it okay so essentially all cells have this maternal paternal set that comes together to give you your DNA okay so with genetics we, we don't really everything is not there's no difference it actually comes together and then you basically go forward but with epigenetics it turns out we originally saw this with imprinting genes back in the sort of the late 90s, early or, uh, around in the early 90s, basically. Was that essentially you you can get, have allele specific regulation, so you can th- have le- things like on the paternal allele that can actually influence what's going on in the paternal allele, and it can go over and influence what the maternal are, uh, maternal side does to basically shut it off. So it's predominantly mater- paternal, or the maternal can do the same thing and shut off. So you have this sex-specific uh, allele's parent of origin allele. So this is why epigenetics doesn't follow, let's say, normal genetic rules. So it doesn't really matter what new DNA comes in. If the paternal allele is carrying this mark, then it can go from generation to generation through that allele. Okay. Because you're not diluting it like you would in normal genetics, where if you have have an effect, you bring in new genetics, things drop down. And next generation, things drop down. So eventually, usually four or five generations, mm-hmm. it, it's dropped down to where it's going to be. I see. Mm-hmm. Right? With epigenetics, you basically get it into like a little specific manner, and then it keeps getting passed. Okay? So that's sort of the difference of how you, you sort of think about this. So for, because of that, what we've seen is some very some very interesting observations. So, for example, we have DDT promoting in our F3 generation, 50% of the animals, both males and females, develop a susceptibility to get obesity. They become obese. Okay, mm-hmm. 50% of our population develops obesity. What we found was, by doing outcrossing experiments, that the male is passing the female obesity. And the female is passing the male is, and it's because of that a little specificity that that's happening. Okay, and so 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 when we see male and female sort of effects, we, it has a number of, sort of components. One is this parent of origin allele, in terms of what's going on, in terms of what parents passing what. So, what we found in adults was if you let's say have a male, adult male, on high fat diet, extremely high fat diet, and the animal gets obese and so forth, okay? And then you actually look at the offspring of that male. It turns out that a generation or two later, it's the female that develops metabolic disease, not the male offspring, okay? Hmm. Because the male is passing that to the female through that allele specific sort of matter. All right, so you, you, so it depends on the disease. Some of them can go be, between for either one, male or female. Some of them go through one or the other. Uh, some of them require both to give you the optimal phenotype. So it's a little bit more complicated. But the adult males, that's one of the better examples, is essentially high fat diet on a male was passing something to the female offspring and its grand offspring. There's another one where they did a, uh, a hearing, a very a hearing adverse noise in a mouse model that pr- promote, promoted a fear sort of thing, and promoted this thing with this hearing thing for the adult male, and this the response to this hearing sort of thing was passed generationally through the male only, not the female. It was going to the male. So there's a number of situations. Like that. Wow. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's that's a difficult thing to simplify, and I think I think you do it really well. Um, so, where can people? Where should people look up your research? I mean, where is the best place for people to find you? So essentially, we have a website, and it's uh, www.skinner.org. 
uh, wsu.edu. Okay, and essentially that's that's the website they can go to. Let me check Good. it. Out. Yeah, yeah. Make sure. <laughs> Did I say that wrong? Or? Yeah, Skinner.wsu.edu. So oh, yeah. on the website, they can see lots of literature. They can see the news around the studies, some documentaries, everything else. And so essentially, that's the best resource for them. And your TED Talk is on there. TED Talk's on there. A number of other uh, Smithsonian sort of documentary. There's a number of sort of uh, things. All of all of our papers that we've published are there in terms of access. And so essentially, that's probably the best site for people. Great. Thank you very much. I really, like I said, I really appreciate what you're doing and, and just how expert you are, not only within the, the actual technical scientific research, but just simplifying the science for everybody. So thanks for coming on. And, you know, it's a great podcast. I'm happy to help and uh, appreciate the uh, public being educated. That's great. <laughs>